Hi, I'm Linda Hubbard from Artists for a Better World, and I'm here to interview Harriet Schock. She's a multifaceted artist, singer, songwriter, author. She's even designed a pendant. Oh my God, so <laughs> amazing person. Thank you, Harriet, for being here. As far as our group is concerned and all the artists in our group, which is a whole variety, you've kind of covered most of it, except for poets or a painter. I'm not a painter. <laughs> except for that. But you know, I bet um, all of our guys could actually learn something from what you have to say. And so the first question I have is, what do you think an artist can really benefit by having a whole group of artists? Oh, well, you know, when you're an artist and you walk into a room and everyone is an artist, you feel like you're home. Sometimes right. your family didn't even feel like that. I mean, if you're an artist in a family of civilians, I call them civilians, people who aren't artists, <laughs> you know, you might feel like an alien. Now, luckily, my father was also a musician as well as a doctor. So I did have the comfort of knowing a fellow artist was there. but. Um, it's not always the case. So if you have fellow artists around you, it's like, oh, I see. They, they speak my language, you know. So even if, yes, I'm a singer-songwriter and my milieu is music and words, but I go to art galleries to get inspired. I go to movies to get inspired. There are many other forms of art that inspire me as a songwriter. And like Billy Collins, the poet, just I just did his master class, and I read him constantly. He's just so brilliant. And yeah, I'm, I'm not technically a poet anymore, so I just do it for fun. You know? Exactly, because we're an artist. We want to create. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. So um, also, um, could you tell our artists a little bit about the key points since you're such a master songwriter? Uh, well, I believe that great songwriting is made of two things, the truth and craft. So if you have the craft and you don't tell the truth, it's sort of a frivolous piece of fluff. And it might, you know, I know there are people who would kill a family member to have a hit. It might become a hit, but it doesn't have the substance that truth really gives you. But if you have the truth without the craft, that's when... People say, I didn't really need to know that much about her. <laughs> You're telling the truth, but you don't have the craft to pull it off. If you have both truth and craft, you could be in the area of Joni Mitchell. You see, you tell the truth with enough craft. It doesn't matter how personal it is. Uh -huh. That craft makes it universal. I love that. Exactly. So... Um so what would you say one of the things that you've learned the most about being an artist for, you know, over so many different, um, you know, different uh, crafts, different um, art forms, the oh, art forms? You know, it's all communication. Thank you. When I write an article that ended up all being in a book, you know, because I wrote 48 articles that were published around and put it into a book, it was just that I was saying something to someone. When I write a song, I'm saying something to someone. Right. It's not, uh, and, and I'm very interested in the quality of communication. I'm upset when people use the wrong word for thing, not because I'm a grammar Nazi, but because we're losing the word infer because we're using it to mean imply, but it doesn't mean imply. Right. It means to glean from what someone else says. So. Language is really important, and the language of music, of composition, is really important. If you can affect someone with the music you create, that's as important as the words, you know? It, there, it's, it's the wavelength on which the words travel. So if you can get to them with that, they don't even have to speak your language and they're affected. That is so true, because there's some songs that are worldwide doesn't matter what language they're in, and people love it because mm -hmm. they, they've got that whole wavelength that they perceive. That's true. So on your, your end, what do you think is the most challenging thing that you've ever done? 
Well, I have been signed to a number of publishing companies. They are the people who supposedly get your songs out there or whatever. But mostly it's just that they take half the money. So I was signed to Motown's publishing company, Joe Bet, and someone at the company said that, you know, Motown was making this film called The Last Dragon. And so I was working with Misha Siegel at the time. We've been working together off and on for 30, 35 years. Mm -hmm. And she said, we need a love song for this movie. Mm -hmm. And I had to get into the head of a young male African-American who studied Kung Fu was a virgin and was falling in love for the first time. Whoa. So I said, okay, what do I have in common with this guy? I'm not studying Kung, Kung Fu. Uh, most of those things did not apply, but I had fallen in love for the first time. So I created a, a lyrically, I created um, a metaphor of how frightening and exhilarating it was and I wrote the lyric to Misha Siegel's beautiful melody of first time on a Ferris wheel. Cause it, it, you're scared, but you're, oh, it's so exciting. And that's the way love is, that's the way a Ferris wheel is. So 40 people have sung it. So apparently it, it worked. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, yes, that's, and plus your song, um, Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady. That one is ultimately, everybody knows that. Well, if you you know, it's strange. They've made a movie now about Helen Reddy's life because a lot of people didn't really know who she was, the whole generation, when she had number eight number one hits. So she should be known. Right. But she decided to go off and do other things. And so she came back and she was just as good as ever. But that decade or so she took off, maybe people didn't remember her, you know. Fame is so fleeting, good heavens. But anyway, I was thrilled that she heard my record on the radio and decided to cover it. And she was very kind to me. She also recorded my song, Mama, wow. which was, uh, yeah, she liked closing her show with it. Excellent, excellent, yes. And what do you think is the key thing that you got out of being you, you go into songwriting, although you can do so many other things. What is the th key reason for that? What is it about songwriting that hits you, your soul? Oh, that's a wonderful question. It's because music is so important to me. I mean, I did poetry writing in college, and but I have to have the music. That goes directly to the soul of a person. And if you can deliver a lyric they can relate to, it helps to have visuals in your lyric, you know, to, to have them see it. And then that is the reason that I, I kind of gave up script writing. I came out here to do that. And I studied with Sid Field and all these things, but I had already had a hit as a songwriter, so I thought, you know, why are you doing these scripts when it takes forever and, you know, plot point one was not on page 20 and they didn't even read it. And so, you know, <laughs> just stop it and write songs. And so I've done seven albums as a singer-songwriter and I love it. I love the performing also, right. you know. And, and it takes less time. And you're so good at it. <laughs> Thank you. It, it takes less time because it's not the long form with an arc and the, you know, a denouement and all that. Well, it sort of is. And you have to do it all in three minutes. So that's kind of hard. But you've got that down. It's so rewarding, though, when you get to sing a new song at a concert or something and people like it and they say something to you afterwards. There's nothing like that. Ah, uh, I'd say the, the whole thing is the, the people and their, their enjoyment of your music. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I have to have the men cry too. I mean, if, <laughs> if the men aren't crying, I've done something wrong. <laughs> I love that. So uh, I hear that you have an exciting new project. You're actually having, there's a movie coming out and it's in production about your life. That's what I hear. You know, I mean, I did a show two and a half years ago at the coffee gallery backstage. And Tom Solari, a wonderful filmmaker, came to that show and he thought, this should not just be this small coffee house, you know, of 50 people. I think this should be known more broadly. Right. So he talked to me about it and I thought, well, I can't write a book about my life because I'm really now, I, I'm not, I don't remember what happened way back when and everything. 
I like to live now and in the future, so I don't remember any of that. So I said, but I could, I could do a movie if, if you really want to do it. And so the day the city closed down for the pandemic, he went on Indiegogo to raise the funds for the first phase of the film, and he did. And so from that, he recorded, he filmed my concert of two hours uh, with five cameras, and Randy Tobin did the sound. And then the next uh, day or so, he recorded me in interviews. And then he put that together in a preview, and that's what's available now. And then we're in phase two. So we're raising the funds for the interviewing the key people in my career. Who were those people? In my life and stuff. Um, I'm not yeah. sure uh, whom he has in mind. I, I suppose it would be um, maybe a, a producer of my first album, producer of my seventh album. I'm not sure. I don't know uh, what he's doing, but as far as that's concerned, but there are definitely key players in my career and in my life. Unfortunately, some of them are not here anymore, like Nick Vinay and Russ Regan and people who were major players in my early career, but, you know. You've got other, other people, though. I absolutely do. Great. So that'll be exciting for you to see, as well as us. <laughs> it's just so generous of people to help him get this film made. I feel responsible somehow uh, for being the reason he's making the film. I hope that people really care enough to, to help him do that. So what we've done is we've offered perks. Perks are what you get if you donate a certain amount for this and that. And one of the perks <laughs> is a generous donation of a loaf of bread from breadness.com. Oh, God, that's the best bread. Random I've ever acts had. of breadness. Yes, yep. I, I am here to tell you how much I love so, it. Sourdough, wow. Yes, artisan sourdough from Randall Michael Tobin. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. if that's a good perk. You yeah, should get there a lot are, of people. <laughs> there are a lot of them. There's a, you know, a, they found a few copies of my original Hollywood Town album that started the whole thing and, you know, covers by. Helen, you know, and Manfred Mann and the Partridge family and all this, but it was the original album, and so Great. some of those are going, you know, Excellent. I just unearthed my little supply. <laughs> Excellent. Why not? Yeah. So this could actually turn into, um, it's like an indie film now, but mm -hmm. it could be, could go to the festivals. You're planning on taking it Hopefully. to the festivals? Yeah, I think he plans to do that. Excellent. So it's his idea. The whole thing was his idea. I wouldn't. I would not even embark on that. Someone wrote me and said, "Wow, how brave of you to produce your own." I said, "No, I would never do that. I, I'd be afraid I couldn't remember the stuff he was asking me." But you know, it turned out I remembered everything he asked me so far. So just take that, take that ginkgo, and hope for the best. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. I love this organization and follow it and am friends with many people in it. And so thank you for having me here.